Good afternoon and welcome to yet another symposium on Is the World Becoming a Better Place? Uh, we will have to do our uh, disclaimer like everybody else, and that's not to promise you an answer to that question by the end of the three hours, as we can't afford people asking for their money back. Um, in the statement, is the world becoming a better place? The emphasis is actually on the world rather than better or a place. If there are two characteristics that would define the world that we live in now, it's interconnectedness and interdependence. And in a world where there is an explosion of isms now, nativism, populism, me first ism. This is bad news. It doesn't matter what you're interested in. If you're interested in global issues like climate change, that's bad news for climate change. Climate change doesn't know borders. You can't seal your borders against climate impact. If you're interested in local issues, and if you get really worked up about uh, inexplicable harsh winters in Skåne, and the train system isn't working, then you only need to look at how the power grid is structured. Where do you get your power from? This is not local anymore. Energy isn't local anymore. Climate isn't local anymore. Climate doesn't happen in faraway land where there are floods and destitute people. You only need to look at coastal erosion right here. You only need to look at change of weather patterns, erratic, what we call weather weirding, inexplicable patterns that happen. So all of this, all of this inward looking, all of this nativism looking, goes counter to what we really need to be doing. So. If you want an answer to, is the world becoming a better place, I think we need to unpack this statement first. And I need, think we need to take a better look at what kind of world do we live in and what kind of world do we want to live in. And that's what we would like to do in the next three hours. And that's what I'm welcoming you to. My name is Mo Hamza, and I'm professor of risk management and societal safety here at Lund University. And I will be your host and moderator for the rest of today until six o'clock. And the format that we have is slightly different, maybe a little bit innovative, but it actually puts the emphasis on you rather than on us here. We'll have three parts, as you see from the program that you're holding. We have three distinguished speakers in the first part. Um, I'll introduce them one at a time and just say a little bit about what they are going to cover each. Uh, Margareta Wallström is a household name here in Sweden, the former special representative to the Secretary General on Disaster Risk Reduction, and her track record and achievements goes from here to infinity. And she will cover the changing nature of disasters, what's happening in the world of natural hazard and disasters. The picture is uneven. We've made some great advances. We've signed the Sendai framework reaction in the same year, and we had the Paris Agreement in the same year. But whichever way you look at it, whether it's disasters or conflict, there are still pockets of inequality. We'll follow that with Dan Smith, the director of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute and the former director of International Alert, and he will look at another aspect, which is conflict and the changing nature of conflict in the world, and reflect on what so-called the nativism that we're going through. Following from that is Sarah Myrdal, the uh, director of international relations at the Swedish Civil Contin EU and international relations at the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency, and she will cover Sweden's role and place in the world, particularly on issues of risk and risk management. Then we'll take a couple of questions to the three speakers, and then we'll shift from that into 
three distinguished professors from Lund University, Henrik Taylor, Johan Bergström, and Emily Boyd, two of my colleagues in the same division, and Emily is the director of the Lund University Center for Sustainable Studies, and each and every one in turn will go through risk to infrastructure systems, risk to societal systems, and risk to ecological global natural systems. And then we'll have a coffee break, and then we will come back, and then we'll have it all out in the open. So we'll have a panel up here, and we will take questions from the audience, and we'll have a proper conversation with the aim of furthering our understanding of what sort of world do we live in, what sort of world do we want to live in, and just walk out of this session with not so much an answer to this very big question, but at least just a little bit more knowledge. So thank you very much for signing up to this event and for being with us here today. I hope you will get as much out of it as you expect, but that will depend on how many questions you ask. So with that, I would like to invite our first speaker and we'll run through them one at a time. Margareta, please. So good afternoon. I don't know how many of you participated in yesterday's debate in Lund, and how many participated in the discussion this morning about women in international diplomacy. Because if you did, I hope you will follow the logic of how all these three discussions fit together. Not because everything we say, but the importance of these issues, how they come together to create the hope for a better world. Now, um, we all have taken guidance from the question. Some people have reformulated it. Can we create a better world? Can I make a better world, etc.? I think I'm going to demonstrate to you that, um, at least in some aspects, the world is getting better. And uh, I will do that, yes, <laughs> and I will do that just by uh, sharing with you some of the perspectives on disasters and the, wor the work that has been done over the past 30 years by countries, communities, and a fairly discreet, not very visible group of scientists, because many of them drifted off to something called climate change and forgot that disaster risk is actually one of the major consequences of climate change. But that's politics. Um, let me first say, um, how, do you, how do you look at disasters? What is it? Because that really is the most important question you ask yourself. Is it a humanitarian crisis that you respond to with your heart? You pay off and you go home. That's one way and a very common way of dealing with disasters. The other way of dealing with disasters, which is where we have gone in the international community and countries over the past 30 years, is disasters is a major, major development challenge and constraint. Yes, people die. But buildings die, infrastructure is destroyed, agricultural output is destroyed, water sources is destroyed. So we've moved from an understanding, let's say 20, 25 years ago, all our thinking on disasters was humanitarian death and destruction. In order to get more attention to the prevention side, we have to move the attention from the humanitarian to social impact, destruction of social infrastructure, loss of schooling days, loss of health facilities. But that wasn't enough to really get the political attention we've concluded was necessary. So we said, okay, let's move economics. That should move into the bigger investment and decisions required. The beginning, that worked quite well but there is a major data gap there. And the final piece of this came when I heard a minister say, disasters are political issues because we can lose our job 
if we fail to respond to disasters properly. And when a minister says that it's not me telling him, an international bureaucrat, I say, here we got the agenda for the future. So this whole, how long time did this take? It took about 30 years to move through this whole thing. 30 years of increasing major catastrophes. Why not necessarily because nature became more violent, but because our societies are more complex, more exposed, more vulnerable, infrastructure, big cities. Those of you who remember Superstorm Sandy, you know what a wake-up call that was for this sense of invulnerability in sophistication of our modern countries, when New York lost power, lived in total darkness, rule of law became an issue, subway stopped for weeks. You know, that sense of helplessness led to very important changes in also how the private sector views disaster. So this whole th perception that disasters is something that happened to poor people, it does for sure. But it also happens to rich people. It happens to poor people worse in rich countries than to rich people in poor countries. So the social inequality about disasters is one of the really critical elements we have now. So when we go from the 1980s, the first UN resolution on the risks of disasters was actually passed in the late 70s or early 80s. So it wasn't that governments didn't, one, have the information, and two, understand that there is something here that is truly disruptive and not really helpful for where we aim to go with our Millennium Development Goals, etc. So did it make it into the mainstream? No, there wasn't much attention to it, except at local level. What happened next was when everyone was ready to give up a bit on this, the Indian Ocean tsunami happened. And that changed the paradigm because disasters have no borders. It is totally unacceptable that plus 200,000 people die like this. Surely we have early warning system technology to warn. And there were a whole set of questions that roll after a different political commitment to move. And that led also to a mobilization of not only governments, but in 2005, January, three weeks, four weeks after the tsunami, I'm pointing at Jonas here because he was your president, because he was a very important Swedish actor after the tsunami based in Southeast Asia. And what happened was an already preset conference established something called the Yoga Framework for Action. What was interesting compared to the Bay about yoga was it said to governments what they were supposed to do. Governments supposed to do this, that, and the third. And I will tell you that many of them did. But they left the rest of us in the annex. UN, NGOs, scientists, women, children, all in the annex. Everything about governments. So how did it go? Yeah, it went a bit slowly. <laughs> Policies, discussions. Somewhere there, I started this work myself, and I said, yeah, I think we need a bit more mobilization here. This is not really going to work if we don't get everyone involved. And when I say everyone, literally, I mean everyone. And um, that has been a very interesting journey, because the question is, in this shift from responsiveness to disasters, we need to have preparedness, we need to be able to save lives, we need to do this, to actually say we can prevent. And what does prevent, uh, prevention require? It requires understanding of risk, it requires planning, it requires investments, and it really requires getting everyone involved. And everyone, you know, we try to think we need social mobilization, push, push. We need money. We need political power. So who's got political power? Governments. Who's got the money? The private sector. And where are the movers and shakers? It's local governments and their partners in communities. And then we had this missing link of science and research. 
Somewhere along the way, the scientists really did disappear from this process, which was quite interesting. And I, I could not really put my hand on where they had gone until I realized it was climate change. That's where the research money was. And we did not have any social scientists, and we didn't have any economists. So that was also mobilization work to broaden the understanding of how to tackle disaster risk. More research was needed, better understanding of the economics, filling the data gap, and the mobilization on social issues. So that's where we started now a number of years ago. To the yoga framework had a span of 10 years. Um, from 2005 to 15. In 2011, we had Superstorm Sandy, I think, 12. In 2011, we had the flooding in Thailand. We had this major event in Japan, earthquake. That's okay, I was going to say, it's not really okay, but the Japanese are used to earthquakes. They got good buildings. A tsunami, that was not so okay because it demonstrated certain weaknesses in how they had built their early warning and preparedness system in terms of people's understanding. And thirdly, which was totally unexpected and unacceptable, the impact on the Fukushima power plant, which demonstrated something that we only started talking about very slowly, a huge weakness in the governance system about institutional responsibility, about accountability, about the understanding of risk and safety. Risk and safety. So th the combination of these mega events, I think, focus people's mind. But is this the full story? No, because who actually pays for disasters? That's the stories that never reach your front page of newspapers, and therefore, Data collection started very slowly, but it's going on now. Um, it's the poor people in the world, of course. Poor countries lose proportionally much more financially and socially than rich countries, because they have less to take from. So you will have a Caribbean island easily losing 160% of the GDP on a hurricane. The banana crop and the tourism infrastructure pulled out. Guess how long time it takes for them to recover? What happens, because they are relatively wealthy countries, um, they are not poor enough to get the grant, so they get offered a loan from the World Bank to rebuild the infrastructure. And before the World Bank has done the feasibility study, taken decisions, etc., two years pass, they get the money, they start, and another hurricane hits. So that's a bit the story of their life. You will have the same thing in many other small island states in agricultural countries. So the conclusion that the people who are looking at this now very consistently draws is that disasters always leave people poorer. There is a myth which has some bearing in reality that the reconstruction generates an economic boom. But it's a very short-term boom, because the jobs that are lost are never recovered. New jobs may be created, but there is no certainty. So we can give you masses of examples on that. But I wanted to take you to the next iteration of this risk understanding, um, which actually strengthens this perspective where I started. Disasters are a development challenge. And if we don't treat them as such, we will never come to grips with what has to be done. So when in 2011 or so, I said, now we got four more years to go, and I asked people, do you think this is it? Is the job done? Can we shut down? Should we just continue as we have started? Or do we need to look at the instrument that we have? And everyone said, no, 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 so much has changed, we need to check, we need to fix again. So, when you start looking at what governments, above all governments actually, have done during these 10 years, and that's why I want to give you a sense of things happen and change, 
So many of them have changed their legislation to try to get a grip on this risk and prevention issue and development. They've introduced new policies. They try to fix institutions. But this takes time. You know, change legislation and get it out there is not a matter of two years. So they said, yes, yes, many things have happened, but be careful, we just started, you know, go easily, don't change everything, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. But still what they wanted to achieve, and not only governments, but they said, we have, to, we have to tackle this issue that climate change and disaster risk are treated as separate issues. It sounds a bit silly to us because we know the reality, but politically, institutionally, financially, it was very separated. It's much better now after the Paris conference. Paris wipes away a lot of these uh, things. Second thing, which is even more difficult, we have to break down the barriers between development planning and disaster risk management. And if you think about it, <laughs> any country, you don't treat building disaster risk management institution and risk understanding separate from your development planning. That's the foundation of sustainability and stability. So this concept, and I could give you your, the theory where I think it comes from, is a very destructive one. And it's even more difficult to change. This is everyone's evidence. I used to say to people, go to the SDG discussions and get your input there. And they say, yeah, yeah, we are trying, but no one is listening to us. Yeah, yeah, we are trying, but no one is listening to us. So cultures, different ways of thinking, defensiveness, money. If I share an example with you from the meeting we had once, um, bringing the climate community and the disaster community together, in preparation for this integration in reality, Good discussions, a little bit you know, feeling their way. And at the end of the meeting, and I thank her, a very courageous person, she put up her hand and said, does this mean that all the climate money will now go to the disaster people? So that's somewhere at the bottom of her heart. <laughs> Genuinely, she was worried that this integration could not really be held together. And I... This was in the Pacific, but I have a similar example from Sweden, actually. <laughs> but I won't go into that. So <laughs> then the third and fourth thing that they really wanted to do, and that will be encouraging for you. Um, one government said, you know, we are building and building, but we don't know if we not get any better. We don't actually know if we are getting more. And we need to be measured. We need to have standardization system. We want to have international standards against which we can measure ourselves in this area. And this is very unique. Who has ever heard governments ask for standards against which they want to measure themselves? But they did. So now we have them. And uh, as a consequence, there was already an initiative to establish an ISO for resilient cities. And the work that has just been finalized on setting global targets to achieve and the indicators against which countries will measure themselves. And then there were many other things. But finally, just to link to what we've talked about earlier today, is this issue of who is involved to move the agenda. If only governments are expected to drive this, it won't work. And they say that themselves. Yes, yes, we are accountable, but we can't do it alone. So who else was there? No longer in the annex, in the Sendai framework that, that Mo mentioned, that was agreed in 2015. Everyone was moved into the center of the agreement. And who, who is everyone? Well, business participated very proactively in the negotiation. So they've got very important commitments put in there. Women was a bit, how do you deal with this women issue? This women issue. 
We never really went into the gender discussion because we said this is actually about women's participation and how do you situate it? Because the profession of disasters tend to have a lot of men in it where it comes from. Hard hats, trucks, ropes, you know, search and rescue have traditionally been, not anymore of course, but very much men. So men tended to be the leaders in these institutions. So how to motivate women professionally to join? Typically, as you know, women at community level are dominant organizers. In Japan, when they looked at this after the tsunami, they found that they had, at the lowest level, community organizers, about 25% women. And then when you came to the next level, 11%. And to the top management, 2% women. This is Japan, one of the most sophisticated countries in the world when it comes to disaster management. But actually, so professionally, the whole area of work will benefit from the development perspective, getting economics, politics, will benefit also from widening the diversity and really the promotion of women is going there. And then young people, persons living with disability, everyone has a say. So it's been a real mobilization that is clearly reflected in the agreement. And the agreement is not only, it's not telling them what to do. It's ask them, what are you going to do to contribute? So the final message to these groups is, so everyone agreed on this. Risk is the most important thing. Governance is critical, it's core. Resilience, social, economic, as looked at the development perspective, and then of course continue to increase and strengthen countries' capability to respond to disasters, which has increased immensely in the past 25, 30 years. But finally, if this governance model that we imagine possible is going to function, don't wait for the government to call you, call them. Otherwise it won't change, because they don't have time. And they don't really know how to figure it out, so you have to help them. So it's trying to empower everyone to keep driving this system, which is only intergovernmental every 10 years. In between the 10 years, it's all up to us. Let me finally quote to you just five conclusions from um, Economist Intelligence Unit. I told you mobilization of the private capital. Superstorm Sandy became the opening moment for business and capital that disasters actually concerned them, also for their own profit and sustainability. And um, we asked the Economist Intelligence Unit, why do you never mention in your country profiles the risks that countries run from disasters? Why don't you mention earthquakes in Indonesia or volcano eruptions? And the answer was, well, we haven't thought about it. So they started thinking about it. And just last year, we finished a common publication where they have actually index countries according to certain criteria of how, they function, how their resilience function. So here are the conclusions, and I'll finish with that. Um, a shift in emphasis from disaster response to preparedness is underway. Governments are, with greater frequency, recognizing the critical role of disaster mitigation and preparedness. Political leadership plays an important role in effective disaster risk management. Budget allocations for disaster risk management are rising in many countries, but dedicated budgets are not yet the norm. Disaster risk is highest in countries where vulnerable societies and high exposure to natural hazards coincide, social and hazards. The resilience of the physical environment dictates much of a country's overall disaster risk preparedness. These are just some observations. The report is available on the internet, Economist Intelligence Unit, and they got a ranking 
if you got a lot of money to invest, you can actually see how countries manage their disaster risks. Which is very exciting. Think of we can do that with the women. Huh? <laughs> so that's just some of the things that have happened at global level, but none of the things that we've done we have figured out at the desk in an office. We picked it up all from what people tell us they need, what works, what doesn't work, where we need to push, and where we need to mobilize political commitment at the highest level. Thank you. So Mo has told me just to jump up here and start straight in, so, uh, so I will. I'm going to cover um, five areas quite briefly, quite skating across the top. I thought I'd tell you in advance what I'm going to do, and then if you're having one of those post-lunch moments, um, when you eyes start and mind start functioning again, you'll kind of roughly know uh, where, where you are. Um, the first one I'm going to look at, I'm going to talk a little bit about conflict trends, where uh, conflict trends and dynamics stand in the world today. I'm then going to look a little bit at the drivers of conflict risk. I'm then going to look at, in under sort of two components, um, the third and the fourth parts of my talk, at political responses. First, at political responses, which I think are increasing the risks, and secondly, at political responses, which I think might help to mitigate those risks. And then fifthly, I'm going to talk almost in practical terms, but this is a university, so I'm not going to get really practical about stuff, um, about what can, be, what can be done. And I thought that I might tell you in advance one of the sort of um, themes, one of the framework of my thinking as I, as I approach these kinds of problems these kinds of issues. And it's, it's actually right here. It's up here in the title. Um, it's not the bit that makes you gloomy. I mean, what a happy place Lund is, you know? Disasters evermore. <laughs> come, and ha come and have a fun afternoon with um, disaster and conflict people. It's, it's after the question mark. It's when you come onto an uncertain world. If you took away the un, would that make it worse or better? Would past, present, and future risk in a certain world actually be a safer place? What I'm going to suggest is that one of the things that we have to learn how to do at a very broad level, this is as individuals, as institutions, as a human community, is to understand that uncertainty is also good. Uncertainty means there are possibilities. Uncertainty means it's not yet settled. You know, when Arsenal are 3-0 down with 30 seconds to go, it's still uncertain. Every weekend. No, all right, I won't go there. It's fine. Don't worry. So, first the conflict trends. A little bit of good news and bad news. The big untold good news story for 20 years after the end of the Cold War was that the world was becoming identifiably, provably, empirically a more peaceful place. The expansion of the zone of peace internationally was quite, quite dramatic. From 1994 until 2007, the number of armed conflicts declined each year. In 1950, before a little spike at the beginning of the 90s, and sorry, 1990, before a little spike at the beginning of the, uh, of the 90s, just at the, the exact year, really, when the Cold War entered, there were 50 armed conflicts. In 2010, 20 years later, there were 30. Right. That, was a, a, that was progress, that was an advance that we failed to register in many ways, perhaps for human reasons. We thought about Darfur, we thought about Iraq, we thought about the war on terror, uh, one of the most ill-conceived human adventures of, of all time, which has only managed to bring us more war and more terror at the same time. But despite all of that, despite the worst efforts of all of those people who were behind those horrible events, actually the world was becoming safer. More peace agreements were being made than ever before, and a higher proportion of them were being fully implemented over a longer period than ever before. 
In 2010, unfortunately, it started to turn. The good news first, the bad news comes second. By 2015, the number of armed conflicts is back up to 50 again. So in a sense, you could say that the progress of the, no the 90s and the noughts has been lost in the last half decade. The f focus of armed conflict has, in some senses, moved. It's less now about sub-Saharan Africa and more about the Middle East than it was. And so that moment of hope, 2011, the so-called Arab Spring, as we came to call it, has actually turned out not to be so much a spring as the onset of probably one to two decades of intense instability, conflict, suffering, and misery. Only in Tunisia do the flowers still bloom, and there it's not really certain that democracy will, will persist. But it's uncertain, and so that's better than it being certain that it won't persist. Warfare seemed to have left Europe after the Balkan uh, period in the 1990s. As we've seen, it's come back. There is a new form of east-west rivalry and east-west contestation, which we don't know quite where it will go. But in some ways, in terms of, if one's thinking east-west and thinking of larger conflicts between great powers uh, or between reg major regional powers, the focus of concern has shifted from Europe to East Asia. Obviously, Northeast Asia, the events of the last um, week or so, the assassination of uh, the Korean, North Korean leader's brother, the, the new missile test of potentially a very long-range um, missile, stated to be a practice run for an attack on American uh, bases in, in Japan, just to keep things nicely stoked up. Uh, the rivalry between um, China and many of the other um, regional players in the South China Sea, and now also um, the beginnings of a confrontation between China and Japan in the East China Sea. So uh, the, the focus of concern in some ways has shifted. Um, it's kind of not quite the same, but similar in a very different location. And just to round this off, um, a quick thought about nuclear weapons. There are now about 15,000 nuclear warheads in the world. It's a horribly high number. It's less than a quarter of what there was at the peak of the Cold War. So the bad news number looks, is actually a good news number. Um, that number is actually declining. Though US-Russian relations um, had been deteriorating uh, in the last um, couple of years, and I say had been because we don't really know where they're going to go in the next year or so. Uh, though those relations had been deteriorating, the agreement, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty that had been made between the USA and Russia in 2010, started implementing in 2011, that is being respected. It's being enacted. So the number of nuclear weapons is actually coming down. So that's good news except for the fact that all nuclear weapon states, and there are now nine of them, counting North Korea as one, all nuclear weapon states are currently modernizing their arsenals in one sense or another. The US and Russia obviously have the most um, uh, uh, ambitious, large programs, but Britain and France are uh, moving on to the next generations with their nuclear weapons. Uh, China is actually expanding its nuclear arsenal at the moment. Um, Pakistan, India, and um, North Korea are all, also seem to be uh, developing their nuclear weapons further. So from a conflict and security point of view, if you feel the world is a more dangerous place now than it was in the middle of the Cold War, I, I would say this is, that's really arguable. I don't actually know how to measure it. But there is no evidence to say that it is really disastrously worse now than in the mid-1980s or the mid-1960s or... If you think that it's worse than it was five years ago, you're a, you're a, or seven, eight years ago, I think you're approximately right. Uh, 
big power interstate relations are worse, armed conflicts are on the increase. Now, what's driving this? Moving on to the, the second area I said I was going to talk about. Um, I'm going to go quickly through um, a number of what I see as being the major drivers of risk in the contemporary world. The first one actually is what uh, Margareta was, uh, was mentioning almost like it was the villain of the piece, but it's climate change. Right? And along with climate change, but climate change is the most dramatic example of the environmental shifts which are happening and the way that those affect uh, the human habitat. It is not a direct A to B causal relationship. When I hear people arguing about whether or not climate change causes war, I have two reactions. One is you are having the wrong discussion, and the other one is you do not have the evidence for this wrong discussion which you are trying to have. Um, the effects are indirect. The effects are on how people live, on their institutions, on how they handle relations between themselves, between each other. And it plays into another area, uh, another area of risk, a second conflict dri uh, risk driver, inequalities. Inequality is increasing worldwide. All available studies show it, whether it's Thomas Piketty or whether it's the studies of uh, inequality in, Northern, in, in Europe, whether it's uh, IMF studies, worldwide inequalities are increasing. And again, the issue is not inequality causes war. But what inequality does do is it creates a large pool of people with grievances and resentment who make a, a, a pool for recruitment, if you like, into armed conflicts as those conflicts begin for whatever reason. Most conflicts are begun for very, very narrow re uh, reasons uh, and are begun by what you could call conflict entrepreneurs who need to invest in the conflict and gain and mobilize support for that. And where will a lot of that uh, support come from? It's from those who are on the receiving end of inequality. The third issue is to do with resources. I haven't got time to go through the figures to try to demonstrate this. But we live not only in a world where the population is increasing, but where the urban population is increasing. Right? It's only 200 years ago that the world population passed the one billion mark for the first time. And at that point, 2% of the world population are believed to have lived in cities. At the beginning of the 20th century, it was 10%. Today it is 50%, and in 20 years' time it's projected to be 70%. And if you work out the statistics of that, what is needed in order to accommodate that increasing urban population is the equivalent of constructing a new city of 3 million people every week for 20 years. Half the urban infrastructure we will be living in in 20 years' time has not yet been built. And that means using up a lot of water, a lot of sand, a lot of metals, of needing raw materials, and of problems about the increasing shortages of both the raw materials that sustain life and the raw materials which are economically and strategically important. And again, that puts pressure on populations, on institutions, on governments, uh, it increases uh, conflicts and makes it harder to handle them. The fourth factor is to do with um, the changing balance in world power. We see that quite clearly now. Russia is more assertive. China is more powerful. The US is whatever the US is at the moment. We can take that up in questions afterwards. I always like it when you have a good Q&A session because you can park anything complex for, uh, for later reference. The EU is also whatever the EU is, um, not an actor, a unified actor in world politics or in world affairs. And this makes it, these changes and others, 
that you're probably aware of because you read the news and you're interested people about the roles of Brazil, India, Indonesia, Turkey, and so on, Nigeria, South Africa. These problems, these changes, they're not necessarily all bad, but they make it more difficult to run the international institutions which have been an important part of handling conflict problems over the past 20 to 25 years. And it, difficulties in making those institutions work effectively are part of the problem that we see today. And the last thing which I want to say about this conflict risks is that we live in a system that is incredibly fragile. It's fragile environmentally, it's fragile in terms of the climate, it's fragile economically, as we saw from the 2008-2009 economic crash. It's fragile financially. How much money is there in the world today? $60 trillion. How much cash is there in the world today? $6 trillion. Figures easy to remember. A leverage ratio of 10 to 1. It would be like... I lend you 100 pounds, and you get 100 pounds in your account. I have 100 pounds in my account, and I lend you 100 pounds. Then you, then you, then you. And over here, I'll do it in euros. 100 euros, 100 euros, 100 euros. Then you, in krona this time, but 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. Right? I just keep on lending you the money. I don't have the money. It's just a paper transfer. But with that mythical money, you buy, you invest, you get wealthy in a kind of way, you have a car, you live a good life. It's just a feeling about that, that it could just explode. Now, what's the response to this? Well, I think that the negative response, the first one which I want to comment on, is to batter down the uncertainties, to make America great again to refer back to a past, to be the Britain we used to be before we got involved with all those Europeans, to be a country that's pure in some kind of way, no uncertainties. It leads to, I think as we see, you know, different political forms it takes, Putin, Trump, Brexit, Marine Le Pen, Wilders in the Netherlands. It leads to Viktor Orban in Hungary, I don't know if you've seen today, but every asylum seeker in Hungary will be imprisoned in containers, in shipping containers, for heaven's sakes. Every single asylum seeker, that's the law that has just been passed. And this leads, as uh, Mo was indicating at the beginning, to less cooperation, less law, less multilateralism, less trust, less commitment, less energy in international institutions, just at a time when we need more. So what would the counter trend be? What's the politics that moves in the other direction? Some of it is to do with policies and actions, but some of it is to do with the tone. Being prepared to be reflective, to think past the first 10 words, as it was said in West Wing. Part of it is to do with evidence, to be ready to be based on evidence. And part of it is to do with a cast of mind, which I kind of think of as being the skepticism of the open-hearted. Right? Be skeptical, ask questions, but do so not with a closed heart, but with an open heart. And I think that we're losing some of the, some of the texture of political discourse. There's so much anger, and there's so much simplicity of statement and we need a little bit more trust in both in kindness and in complexity. So three things that could then be done. One is, which the Swedish government is doing, and I'm so pleased to be uh, offering advice from time to time when asked about this, but I'm so proud to see Sweden doing this on the UN Security Council, is to be taking climate change into the Security Council. It is an issue that threatens human security worldwide. It should be being discussed there. The second thing is to address inequalities. Inequality is a social issue, it's a security issue, it's a human issue. And the third thing is to revive something quite old-fashioned. But when I was 
going to a, an institution like this, it was what we talked about all the time, and I think we ought to see a little bit more of it in the world today. Solidarity. Solidarity with people whom we don't know and causes which are theirs, but not necessarily to begin with ours. Thank you very much. So, thank you so much. It's a, really an honor to be here and to attend this fantastic birthday party and, of course, also to address such a well-educated audience. It's also a privilege to speak after Dan Smith and, and Margareta Wallström to be on the same panel as these great people who have given us some fantastic talks here today. And I'm so happy because I feel they've set the stage for me in a great way. You've talked about challenges, uh, drivers of risk and conflict around the world, but we've also heard, I think, some positive messages of things moving in the right direction, some at least. Um, in my talk here today, I will not start in the global arena. I will rather move down to the national level and discuss a bit the response of national systems to this changing risk environment that we have talked about. I will be a bit self-critical, and I will ask the question, how well equipped are we really at government level to address this changing risk landscape? Are we on top of things, or are there areas where we do need to improve? That's the question that I'm putting out there. But I will leave it hanging for a little while, because I promised our moderator, Professor Mo Hamza, that I would start by introducing the agency that I'm representing, the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency, MSP. Mo has been working with MSP for many years now, providing scientific advice into the work we're doing on disaster risk reduction and capacity building. But he still gets many questions from friends and relatives and people here at university, teachers, students, about this agency, MSP. What is MSP actually doing? Or perhaps not doing, because we do many things. We have a very wide scope of activity. And uh, so I... I thought I'd start with this. What is MSP? And uh, MSP was created in 2009, so we've been around for eight years now. And we were established very much in the aftermath of the tsunami that we heard about, that Margarita also talked about, uh, which was one of the most deadliest disasters we've experienced so far. It took 500 Swedish lives, more than 500. So it was a real challenge to Swedish preparedness at the time. And I think for many different reasons, but I think one of the reasons was that we were not mentally prepared then for a scenario where we would have to rescue our own citizens in a country far away. So in that respect, I think the tsunami was a very good example of the kind of really challenging risks that, we have, that we're discussing here today that are in many respects transboundary in their nature and in their scope, in their impact on society. And by transboundary, I mean that they transcend, they run across all these boundaries, geographical, administrative, jurisdictional. We work a lot with such risks at MSP, and we try to reduce their impact on society. And we do this by facilitating cooperation and coordinated action. So this sounds a bit vague, I'm aware of that, but it actually works. And what we do is that we bring together a very wide range of, of stakeholders, and we, and we make them sort of share, share the information in a structured way. And they come up with something which is a common operational picture, if you will. We also guide them along the way with knowledge. We provide different kinds of analysis. We also fund excellent research, for example, here at Lund University. We have some money, which usually helps. We have about one billion in Swedish crowns that we allocate for investments in, in different projects on prevention and preparedness. And uh, we can also regulate. This is our least powerful tool. The, the best one is actually knowledge, but we can regulate, and we do that in certain areas, for example, in risk and vulnerability analysis. 
we use what is often called the whole of society approach, which is what Margareta spoke about. This is what is needed. So we work across all levels of government, from the local level, the local municipalities, to the regional and up to the international. We're also operating we have a very wide risk and threat spectrum. It's called an all hazards approach. So we deal with everything from the accident to the large scale events, the natural disasters, uh, to a cyber attack. We host the, the national CERT function, the computer emergency response team of Sweden. We would also deal with the consequences on society of a pandemic, for example, or nasty diseases like Ebola. We were present in Liberia and in Sierra Leone. So we work at home and we work abroad. We do international uh, humanitarian disaster relief, but also long-term, more long-term capacity building, disaster risk reduction, what Mo is helping us with. So we do a lot. And on top of this, we also organize exercises and we provide training. I'm looking at my colleague here from MSP. So we have training colleges in Revinge, close to Lund, and also up in the north of Sweden. So that was MSP quick version, and I'm happy to get back to MSP later on uh, during the Q&A or in the panel discussion. But let me now return to where I started, namely, are we doing a good job at national level? My short answer would be that we are doing many, thing, many things right, but I also want to be honest already now and say that we are struggling a bit with certain areas. One such area that I would like to highlight here is understanding risk, which was also mentioned by you, uh, which is also the first priority in the Sendai framework, I should say. And uh, both Dan and Margareta spoke about the need of having a solid knowledge and evidence base, and I completely agree. And for us, as a government agency, this is particularly important because we deal with taxpayers' money here. So we have to know that what we use them for, our not endless resources, that what we use them for is actually the right things, that we're making the right priorities. If we decide to allocate millions to flood prevention in one part of Sweden, we need to know that this was the right investment. It has to be based on a good risk analysis. We could have invested it in pandemic preparedness, but we chose flood prevention. So we need a solid knowledge base. Fortunately, we are not starting from scratch here. I mean, we've been struggling with this for many years now, building a knowledge base on risk. We have uh, in Sweden a system which is quite unique in Europe, I would say, where we do risk and vulnerability on all levels in society, at the municipality level, the county council, the county administrative boards, all government agencies do risk and vulnerability analysis. And we at MSP, we gather this wealth of information on risks, and we add some elements, and we provide a national risk assessment that we hand into government, and which also goes all the way up to the EU. Because uh, we have at EU now, at EU level, something called an EU risk overview of major risks impacting the Union. And this is a merge between 28 member states' national risk assessments. We have at international level, we have the Global Assessment Report provided by the UNISDR. We have the IPCC. There is a wealth of information. We know lots of things, but these risks are slippery bastards. They are moving targets. And I think Mo mentioned in his introduction the interconnectedness. So the, the risks keep changing. So we add a bit of new technology, which changes human behavior. We add some new extreme weather patterns, and we have a whole new range of risk perspectives. Margareta mentioned the Fukushima triple disaster perfect examples of risks interacting, earthquake, tsunami, nuclear disaster. We had in, in 2006, we had a power outage in Europe. It started in Germany, a small glitch, human failure. It spread out to eight member states. Now, the impact wasn't that large. It was quite quickly fixed, but it still illustrates the vulnerability of this interconnected infrastructure. So this is what we're up against. So it's a bit like Sisyphus. So we push the stone up the hill, 
and it comes down, but in a new shape. So what can we do about this? First thing, build close alliances with our academics. And particularly, I would say, those specialized in the science of complexity and interconnectedness. And I'm really happy, I have Henrik here in front of me, I'm really happy that MSP has now started cooperation with the, the Lund Center for Critical Infrastructure Research, CENSIP. So I have very high hopes for, for our cooperation over the coming years. Another key point uh, that I think both Margareta and Dan touched upon is the need for us on the government side to become much more innovative when it comes to engaging with the private sector. This is a topic that has been discussed for many years, ever since I started at MSB, public-private cooperation. I've attended numerous conferences on public-private cooperation, where 95% of the participants are government officials. 5% at best are from private sector. I've even attended one such conference with zero participants from the private sector. So what is the reason for this? Well, I think there is some kind of unease, generally, among government officials to interact with these nasty profit-driven people on the private side. So we prefer to keep them at arm's length. But this isn't working anymore. We can't do this. We need to get our hands a bit dirty. Because these risks that we have out there are so complex, and the private sector, they sit on so much on the critical infrastructure, on so much of the skills, the money, uh, the expertise. So we have to find new ways of, of interacting here. And uh, I was exaggerating a little bit earlier. Um, I mean, there is unease, but I mean, at MSP, we do have public-private cooperation. We have a number of platforms for public-private cooperation. We have one in the financial sector, we have one in the transportation sector, we have on cyber security, media preparedness. These are working really well. But my point is that I think we will need to go broader and we will need to work in different ways. And I'm thinking stuff we are already doing, trusted information sharing, working together on standards, for example, very important. But I think we will need to integrate private participant companies, these operators of critical infrastructure, more closely into the core of our planning for prevention and preparedness. One important driver here will be the work we are doing currently on civil defense, because we are now, for the first time since MSD was established, we are also planning for the war. This is a new thing. And uh, within this planning, we are asked to consider a number of very concrete minimum requirements for resilience, also called baselines for resilience in a number of areas, mass evacuation, transportation, energy supply, food supply. So this will be, I think, uh, quite a strong push for us, and it will, it will force us to bridge this mental gap and to actually start building closer alliances with the private sector over the coming years. Before finishing, uh, I also want to touch upon another area where I believe we have some untapped potential and that is in the relationship with our citizens. And this is, of course, very important. Everything that we do to build resilience aims to our citizens. But here I also want to be a bit self-critical again and say that during the Cold War, I think this worked really well. We were quite clear in our instructions and recommendations to citizens how to prepare for the war and how you can contribute. I think a bit of that got lost as we moved into the 90s in this complex, new and wide risk and threat spectrum. The good news, though, is that it's picking up again. And we are seeing at MSP uh, quite a growing interest among the population to act as volunteers to participate during crisis and disasters. This is very this is excellent, and this is obviously something we have to encourage. Here I also want to mention a positive development in terms of all this fantastic new technology that has both good and bad sides, but the good sides in terms of, of interacting with citizens is that 
it definitely makes things very much easier when we have stuff like crowdsourcing, for example. Uh, this has been used in many crises and disasters. We had, for example, Haiti already in 2010. Uh, crowdsourcing was used to map out where we had uh, people trapped under the rubble to, to be able to redirect resources, medical supplies, search and rescue. We had it during the Ebola crisis. Um, to map out areas where we had infected patients, but also to spread quite sort of concrete advice on how to avoid becoming infected and what to do if you have somebody who's infected. So good advice and good recommendations. I think this new technology is a bit of a game changer when it comes to uh, citizen resilience and how we're interacting. Before, I know my time is running up, but um, I just want to use this occasion also to make some publicity for a campaign that MSB is launching uh, beginning of May, I think it's the 8th of May, uh, called the Crisis Preparedness Week. We're doing it together with the movers and shakers, all these local municipalities out there in Sweden, and um, the focus is citizen resilience and how you can, first of all, be prepared yourself, but also help your community to get better prepared. It's a really exciting campaign. We have more information, obviously, on our website, msb.se. So where does this take me? What are my conclusions from this talk? Are we coping or not at the national level? Well, I think my answer will be quite modest. Um, if we look at the grading, they keep changing these grading scales all the time, but I think on, in secondary school now it's A to F, with F failed and A being the best. I would give us a strong C, approaching a B perhaps. And we're not quite on top of things, but I, I would still like to point out that we are aware of the challenges, and we are working on them. And I think that's a very good start. And that's where I will finish. Thank you very much, Margareta, Dan, and Sarah. So quite an uneven picture, and a very nuanced one. Uh, huge advances in, say, renewable energy, for example, but unmatched by leadership to put that into effect, not so much in Sweden, but in other parts of the world. Um, the same to do with conflict. So what this has actually led to is a paradigm shift in risk, in defining risk, in risk assessment, and in risk management. We're going to shift now to the scientific and evidence base. And I know that it says in the program that we were going to take a couple of questions. But when you invite uh, people of this caliber, and when you know them personally as well, and you tell them you're running over time, you can't sort of jump and, uh, and, and say, please stop talking now. Um, so we're just slightly running sort of ahead of time. So in order to keep time, just hold on to your questions, and we will have a lot more space at the end. So what I would like to do now is to kind of shift to our three distinguished academics who will run through how our thinking and understanding of risk, defining assessment and management, moving into yet another sort of more sophisticated and complex approach, what we call the system of systems. Nothing sort of is separate now, whether it's an energy grid or a transport system, you turn on the tap, and you get your water. Do you know where that comes from? Do you know what sort of sort of processes that gets that drop of water out of the tap? And what actually happens if part of this system collapses or cascades? And we'll move from that to understanding risk in a societal context and an ecological and an international context. We'll run through these in succession, and then we'll have a coffee break, and then we'll come back, and we'll have more questions. And we'll have the whole panel up here on the stage. So I would like to invite Professor Hendrik Taylor first, um, and then Professor Johan Bergström and Professor Emily Boyd after that. Hendrik.
So uh, I was sitting here listening to these very interesting talks, and I just realized I have to warn people. There is a PowerPoint coming your way now, uh, so I think i give you some heads up. Um, Henrik Taylor is my name, and I'm going to talk about uh, risks to critical infrastructure and technical systems. Now, uh, I guess the first question I should start with, what does that mean? What does critical infrastructure and technical system mean in the context of risk and disasters? Well, I guess we all have an intuitive feeling of what a technical system is, right? But what is a critical infrastructure, really? Well, a rough definition is system and assets that are essential for the functioning of a society. Now, that might not clarify things a lot, so I'm going to use a simple example to illustrate it a little bit more clearly. It's a personal example. Um, it's, it's a normal day in my life, actually. Uh, and uh, a normal day in my life starts up with this, coffee. I wake up in the morning and turn on my coffee machine, and I bring the coffee in a thermos flask down to my train station. Since I live in Kungsbacka, which is quite far from here, I have to commute for a while, and eventually I arrive in Lund, I take the bus up to LTH where I work, go into my office, and turn on my computer. Send a lot of emails and do a lot of other stuff, and then I do this in the reverse in the evening. So, <clears throat> in order for me to do all this, I am dependent on a number of critical infrastructures. Uh, for example, Coffee. I need water to brew my coffee. And in Kungsbacka, where I live, um, there are roughly 60,000 people dependent on water, and we drink a lot of water every day. Um, and in order for us to have the water in the tap, of course, we need, need a lot of pipes. In Kungsbacka, roughly 700 kilometers of pipes. But there are other things as well. We need 18 pressure pump station, we need a water tower, and of course, a lot more. We need people operating these systems. And this, I think, is a general characteristic of these critical infrastructure. You only see parts of them. You only see the tap when you turn it. Or, like the other ones, you only see the trains. You don't really see what's going on behind the scenes of these infrastructures. And if you look at the development of them, like transportation system, communication system, you'll see that many of them started out as local systems, small local system, perhaps within a city or between a few cities. And now they have grown into bigger and bigger and bigger systems. Sometimes these systems, of course, spans entire nations, sometimes between nations. What is even more important from a risk management perspective is that they are also growing interconnected. So they are growing together into system of systems. From a risk management perspective, that's a challenge because no longer is it clear where one system starts and the other one ends. And that poses challenges. Now, increased interconnectedness, you could ask, well, isn't that good? because it gives rise to a lot of new services and more efficient services. So surely that is good. And yes, what's the problem? I like watching on-demand movies, and I pay my bills over the internet, so that's all good. And yes, that is true. But there is a flip side to this. And the flip side is what Sora called transboundary crisis. Because when everything works out as it's supposed to do, well, this works fine. But when a crisis strikes, this increased interconnectedness makes it much easier for the consequences to jump these boundaries. And it can be boundaries of administrative boundaries, but it can also be functional boundaries between different types of systems. And when we're talking about critical infrastructure, we use a term called cascading effect. Basically, this is the domino of critical infrastructures. You know, the domino where you put the tiles in a row and you flip the first one and it goes on the second and it goes on the third and so on. Well, the idea here is similar, that once you get a critical infrastructure affected or 
degraded to some extent, the effect will spread to the next one and to the next. And here's an example. We have heard uh, several examples uh, already. Hurricane Sandy, uh, the European um, blackout. And here's another one, blackout in the US in 2003. This one is one of the 10 worst blackouts ever. Uh, and it started with a tree. A tree coming in contact with the power line that led to a series of events eventually resulting in a lot of people without power for a long time. Of course, you realize that this will create a lot of trouble for other systems, because as everyone knows, we're all dependent on electrical power. But what is most interesting, I think, with this event is actually the investigation report following this. And here's a quote from that. The North American power grid is one large interconnected machine. Now, if you think about it, this is a machine that spans an entire continent. And it doesn't stop there because there are so many other systems heavily dependent on electricity. So you can actually say the machine is much bigger than that. So at this stage, I think it is worth noting that uh, critical infrastructures are not only technical. I think it's important to point out that because you might get that impression from me talking. Um, but, of course, there are sectors in our society where we'll find critical infrastructure where, okay, there are a lot of technical systems, like energy supply, transport. But there are also other sectors where you'll find critical infrastructure that maybe are not so associated with technical systems. Food supply, for example, or others. So, um, moving on, uh, this increased interconnectedness creates challenges for risk management. And in order to understand these challenges, we have to look at the development of risk management, the practice of risk management. It started out in different industries like nuclear, uh, insurance, banking, uh, and others. And I would say that nowadays, risk management is everywhere. Everyone does it. Even Lund University does it. Even my division does it. You do this risk assessment, etc. So it's spread. But this is what I call old risk management. You're heavily focusing on one organization and a limited amount of hazards that might damage that organization. But what is more relevant now, in due to this interconnectedness, is this. Collaboration. We have multiple actors sharing information, collaborating in terms of identifying risk, analyzing it, and potentially also making something about them. And it's not certain that all the wisdom we have from the old regime is usable in this new regime. So we have to be wary. So I will end here uh, by offering some glimpse into current research trying to address these challenges. And the first topic here is um, modeling. Modeling of critical infrastructure in order to identify risks and vulnerabilities within these systems. And here are some examples from colleagues of mine. Here we got two figures showing Sweden. The one on the right is the electrical distribution system. The one on the left is the train distribution system. These are models, usually in a computer, where you can analyze different types of risk and vulnerabilities built into these systems from different perspectives. And here's another one that you probably know, you can't recognize it, but it's actually Scania here. Uh, it's the train system of Scania, and the colored part on the left side, that is sub seven subsystems that are needed in order for the trains to operate in Scania. And what they can do here is look at different combination of events that might damage the function of these systems. Now, this is one type of research ongoing. Another type is more concerned with the fact that we now need to collaborate. The challenge of actually analyzing and communicating risk between different actors, and that is a challenge. And there's a lot of research going on in this area as well. 
and it connects very well to what Sora was mentioning about risk and vulnerability assessment. This is a typical example of where you have direct use of this type of research, how to analyze and how to communicate risk in this diverse setting where you have multiple actors, possibly with different values and, and perspective, like private companies, uh, public agencies, etc. And that's, that's another area of ongoing research uh, with potential for, for interesting results here. So I will go to finalize my talk by going to this question. Is this still a technical problem of analyzing and communicating risk in this context? And by that question, I'm actually going to leave to the next speaker, which is Johan. So. Thank you so much, Henrik. Yeah, indeed, this doesn't look like all that of a technical problem anymore. Henrik's slide here looks much more like a social network of interacting actors, and it indeed is. And it is indeed one way in which we approach risk management today. One way that we approach it is through mapping these very social networks. We have researchers, for instance, mapping the social networks involved in uh, urban water resource risk management in Sweden and abroad, and they map those to look for the critical nodes, the critical actors, for functional and structural gaps that will need to be bridged in order to manage risk more efficiently. So as risk management indeed has become more and more of a social problem, we as researchers have followed. And my name is Johan Bergström. I'm a colleague of Henrik at our division of risk management and societal safety. And I will introduce you to what I see as three trends, looking at both research and policy, as we have had introduced here also in, in the beginning of this session, on societal risk management. The three trends are that safety and security is becoming more and more one and the same thing, the all hazards approach, if you like. The second trend that I will introduce is that resilience is the notion then introduced as a solution to this problem. And the third trend is that risk management is not even all that much management as it is governance nowadays. But I will get back to that, of course. Let's start with the first trend, that safety and security have come and are becoming more and more treated as one and the same thing in public policy, discourse, and indeed also research. The big game changer here was 9-11, the terror attacks to the US back in 2001. It changed the rules of the game. Some four years later, the Hurricane Katrina struck the same country, the US, and the same thing there. What events like these reminded humanity was that not only threats, but also their magnitudes are inherently unpredictable. And it is pretty hard to mitigate, control, or manage what you cannot even predict in the first place. So this recognition led to new agencies formed, as we have heard also earlier, with responsibility for both safety and security. So in the US, the Department for Homeland Security. In Sweden, the Civil Contingencies Agency, MSB, was formed with both safety and security threats in their management portfolio, their all-hazard approach again. And this is a growing portfolio. Because if the threat is inherently unpredictable, pretty much anything could be a safety and security problem. And this is a process, this process of turning more and more social activities into risk management activities, that is a process that research calls securitization. A process by which aspects of societal life becomes aspects of risk management policy. So just to give you a very simple example, uh, the argument that also Swedish home care delivery services 
should have access to the radio communication system called Rakel that binds together all actors in the Swedish crisis management system. That argument is the argument that also the activity of home care in Sweden should be part of a risk management network and discourse. And so the safety field and risk management field has grown through this process of securitization. And agencies like MSB, for instance, have responded to this by saying, hey, this is getting too big. We cannot manage this anymore from a centralized perspective. We need to start decentralizing responsibility for risk management down to more local actors. And this decentralization of responsibility is one that's been advocated through the notion that we've also heard mentioned several times already, the notion of resilience. Because recognizing that we, that we as humanity in this geological age that we call the Anthropocene, that we are responsible for both the safety and security threats that we face can be pretty discouraging. But in the notion of resilience, we've found the optimistic belief that we can do something about it. Resilience is what represents our belief in our ability to continuously adapt to this inherently unpredictable environment that we face. And just to give you a brief history of the term, resilience doesn't make any sense in Scandinavian languages. In Anglo-Saxon languages, it makes a lot of different senses to different schools of thought. In material physics and engineering, resilience has since the 19th century been treated as the ability of a material to regain its shape after being put to stress, for instance. The resilience of a spring is the ability of a spring to regain its former shape after being put to stress. Now, in psychology and health research, a completely different story. In psychology and health research, where resilience have been, have been the focus of attention since the Second World War, basically, resilience represents the ability of a human to thrive despite adversity. And typical study objects have been war-traumatized children or veterans. And their resilience has been used as sort of a counter-theory to post-traumatic stress. They talk about post-traumatic growth instead as resilience theory. Then if we go to ecology and ecosystem sciences, resilience has since the 1970s been the ability to continuously adapt to constantly evolving and changing stressors. And here you see the connection to public risk management discourse that this is how it's implemented in policies worldwide, but mainly in the Anglo-Saxon world, back to 9-11 and Katrina being very much the wake-up calls. It's resilience policy to emphasize that crisis preparedness, that preparedness to the unpredictable crisis takes place in local communities and networks. Like the social network on Henrik's slide, if you like. And this is how it's also been and is continuously implemented. Sara mentioned the upcoming Crisis Preparedness Week. Here is an example from Australia. The, they always put them in flowers in Australia. I don't know why. This is the, the pamphlet for the Get Ready Queensland campaign. One of the campaign folders for Get Ready Queensland. Similar campaign run every year prior to bushfire season in Queensland in Eastern Australia. And here I, as a citizen, can get the First four-step guide, the first one, prepare your emergency plan, and I get information for how I do that. Second one, prepare my emergency kit with information to how I do that, prepare my home, tune into warnings, and then some scenario-based guidelines. Resilience as this decentralized responsibility of me as a citizen to get ready for the unpredictable crisis. And I was talking to the campaign director of this specific campaign in an interview, and he said, yeah, but this is important in order to combat a culture of learned helplessness. A culture of learned helplessness, he referred to. And there is a sociological critique 
of introducing resilience in this way. There is the sociological critique that resilience discourse in this way represents a sort of neoliberal drive to push responsibility down to the most of local of actors in society for state agencies and bodies to, to step back from their responsibility. There is also the critique that this resilience discourse represents little more than an Anglo-Saxon colonialization of risk management ideals. And there might be something in that critique as well to, to consider. But I think this is a clear example of how risk management is not so much even a problem of management anymore as it's a problem of even political governance. And that's my third trend of, of this talk, that governing risk, dictating the rules of this risk game, influencing these social networks, are all acts of governance and power. And when power is exercised, there will be resistance. When power is exercised, there will be winners and there will be losers. So who are those? Well, it's actually one of our research questions. We have, for instance, an excellent PhD student going to Nepal to study the adaptive strategies used by Sherpa communities there. And we send students to various places around the world that we would perceive as high risk and ask for their local perceptions of the people living there. And we see over and over again in our data that we cannot discuss risk exposure in terms of rational choices or even in terms of irrational delusion or biased belief. We can only understand risk exposure in terms of history, in terms of culture, in terms of inequality, and in terms of power. Because in this securitized world that we are in, we see more and more states advocating the need, and the US is leading the way here, in advocating the need for a culture of preparedness. Essentially what they are doing is that they are dictating what normative values that we are supposed to embody and share. And with state institutions and governments dictating what normative values that we are supposed to embody and how they should guide our actions, I think perhaps there is the, need, there is the risk that we forget a much more important discussion of whether we and others do have the necessary resources to adapt in the first place. Because we cannot ask people to start adapting without having the necessary resources and capacities to do so in the first place. And I think if there is something that we as a scientific community can do, that is to speak up for those with limited resources to adapt in the first place. Because if we start blaming future disaster impact on lacking adaptive capacities on part of those who might not have had anything to do with the development of the threats in the first place, and that's not just unfair, that would be an abuse of the power to define the rules for the game of risk governance. I leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to invite our Professor of Sustainability Studies, Emily Boyd, to take it from here to introduce us to risk to infrastructure, environ sorry, to environmental livelihood and ecosystems. There you go. Thank you very much. Thanks. and livelihoods. 
Thank you very much, and now you can hear me. So I'm just going to talk about three things. The current thinking on global risk, just to bring us back to some of the big frameworks that we're working with in terms of climate change. I'm going to say something about the ecosystems and livelihoods and the stresses that are experienced very much at the local level and argue that um, when we talk about climate risk, actually, it's a sustainability matter. And then I'm going to pose a couple of questions at the end about how do we link these local dimensions back up to the global with a couple of provocative thoughts. So firstly, um, okay, so let's start off with, in this talk, I'm going to talk about three dimensions uh, as a framework to the way we're thinking about climate change now. And the first is the one and a half degree target, uh, which is a real sort of material constraint to the way we're thinking about climate and climate risk. And the recent Paris Agreement, which has basically committed to us to um, stabilize at one and a half degrees. So we're stabilizing below two degrees below pre-industrial emissions, and we're trying to achieve a one and a half degree temperature stability. And the science is telling us, although it's uh, predominantly based on modeling, but it does show that actually there is a difference between two and a half degrees and one and a half degrees in terms of the impacts and consequences for our ecological systems, for the way that um, precipitation manifests itself to extremes, the way that there are impacts, for example, on coral reef systems, and the way that it's going to impact on the levels of sea level rise, for example. So that's a real material constraint that we're facing. There's an increasing link between uh, the understanding that we have around extreme events, and this links back to the, some of the previous talks we've had today, which have very much been focused around risk, and linking these one-off extreme events back to climate change. And while there's still significant gaps in our understanding about this, we're starting to understand better through attribution studies, and these are scientists who, who are using models to try and understand the link between the emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and the events that we see. And there have been studies that have demonstrated the link between the likelihood, increased likelihood, or the probability of intensity of extreme events linking back to climate change. And we're at the early stages of this, but this is a really fundamental big shift in our thinking around risk and linking it back to climate change. The third aspect to the current framework as I talk about is this notion of that there are limits to adaptation. And this is really interesting because this is where risk Analysts and people with risk understanding have really brought in a perspective into the climate change adaptation community and said, you know, well, there might be a limit uh, to the extent that societies can adapt to climate change or ecosystems can adapt to climate change. And so, therefore, this is really also dependent on the levels, the thresholds at which society accepts risk. So it becomes then an issue of governance, and it becomes a societal matter. So these are sort of frameworks that are influencing the way we're thinking and the way that we're um, thinking about governance and risk management increasingly. So my second point here is, okay, we have these frameworks that we're operating within, but we need to then look down on the ground, so to speak, and we need to look at the people and the context within which climate change is impacting, and here, we are gaining a better understanding that the way that we think about managing these risks in the local context is not just about providing critical infrastructures, which is an important dimension, of course. Um, it's not just a, about providing uh, the walls and the infrastructures, but it's also about thinking about the softer sides, the social, the political context, um, and how we go about understanding those better in a kind of holistic way. Obviously, considerations are multiple. So when we think about the local, um, at least I do, I think about the ecosystems and the ecological context. And we see that this matters because in the ecolo local ecological context, climate change pay plays out in terms of affecting water availability or crop yields or sea level rise, which then has implications for the way that we grow our crops, for example, or whether our soils are becoming more saline. So, for example, we see in the Sundarbans in India now increasingly that communities are affected 
by the fact that sea level is rising, there's increasing uh, salinization of their crops, so their crops are failing. This might be compounded with cyclones, increase uh, evidence of um, small cyclones that are hitting the coastal areas, combined with other globalization, economic, political parameters, but which lead then to affecting people in their everyday livelihood. People are having to maybe move out of the areas. Um, fathers and mothers are having to leave their kids behind with the grandparents and while they go and seek work in the cities, for example. And there are um, issues around health, there are issues around mental uh, implications and effects that this has on those orphans that are left behind, as an example. So you can see that these effects on ecosystems have an effect on livelihoods, have an effect on people. And we're thinking about um, areas of the world where we're starting to see what we, we've sort of thought were um, a sort of the common trends in terms of effects on ecosystems are now, as I mentioned, being compounded by extreme events. And for example, we saw in 2015 uh, floods in Malawi and Mozambique that were very unusual. Compounding this together with these longer periods of drought uh, context, this results in things like food shortages for people and so on. So you can start to see the link, which was made very eloquently by uh, Margaret there about the link between DRR and development, it becomes even more imperative to advance our understanding in that regard. So we talked about ecosystems, we talk about communities a lot, and we also heard about individuals earlier on, and that, that these are implications for individuals. So um, what's very interesting to me are the three to 400 million people who are living in chronic poverty, the people who for example, uh, might go through a process of sort of mobilizing out of poverty, but then they're hit by a stressor and then they fall back down again. Uh, and this could be uh, also communities and individuals that are suffering from, for example, the 800 million people that are suffering from malnourishment in the world. So um, we can see here on this uh, nice picture, I don't know if you can see it very well, but this is an example of an individual uh, called Emmanuel. He's 65 years old and he's from rural Tanzania. And in his life history, you can see here, if I had a pointer I could show you, that um, at points in his life, um, he's gone through stresses and they've hit him as an individual. Okay? So he's lost the advantage at some point in his life. Just to correct the mic. Oh, sorry. I'm having issues with my mic. better? Okay, great. Thank you. Much better. Okay, so, um, so we see Emmanuel. He's um, been uh, hit by uh, losing his education after a bridge collapses in his village, for example. Um, but then he finds a way to buy his um, invest in some assets over time, so he goes into fisheries. He's hit by a, a personal tragedy in his life. And then there's also, um, he's also hit by uh, changes in terms of the fishing regulation. But we could think about that as um, you know, an external shock. We can think about that in terms of, if we think about climate change and the effects that that is gonna have on the fishing sector, for example, and the livelihoods linked to that. We can then see how individuals are affected, and it comes back down to how individuals are affected by these stresses and how they are able to uh, adapt to climate change. So this is work um, from the Chronic Poverty Network, and they point out that um, it's really important to link together with um, disasters, for example, disaster risk reduction, thinking about how we can tackle chronic poverty, how we tackle these issues around discrimination, for example, we've heard earlier, it really links back to many of the things that have been said earlier uh, today. Um, how can we support to prevent conflict, for example, uh, to reduce vulnerability and so on. Um, building ways for people to actually build their capacity out of, out of poverty uh, and these stresses that they experience. So this is my third and final point here. I have a few more minutes left. Um, so, okay, so we have this sort of global framework that we're working with, with uh, one and a half degrees. Uh, we're trying to live within the limits to adaptation, so to speak. Um, and these uh, 
increasing potential likelihood of links between disasters and climate change. Um, and on the other hand, the other end of the spectrum is the local, how do we bring these things together? I mean, this is the you know, opposite ends of the spectrum. And one sort of provocative way in which these things may be linked together is the notion of attribution here. And it's a, it's a provocative area because some people say that we cannot attribute every event or whole suite of events of climate change and how to greenhouse gas emissions, but also what does it say in terms of how people are then compensated for the effects of these disasters on their livelihoods. We know from uh, the National Academy of Sciences last year published a report uh, which was showing us that we can now link certain events much more uh, readily um, to climate change, but nevertheless, we don't have the tools yet to be able to think about politically what this means in terms of those individuals. So Emmanuel from the village in Tanzania, is his livelihood affected by climate change because of the disasters that have struck him? How do we then link that up to the global level? So uh, I was thinking about this, and this has come up uh, throughout the talks today, it feels that there is some notion of uh, importance of responsibility and instilling responsibility across scales and how do we actually go about doing that effectively and not in a way that's naive and I really liked the conclusions earlier um, that were made about the solidarity point and linking people uh, through existing frameworks but perhaps new frameworks so uh, one potential framework might be thinking about a human security framework the group Open Democracy are talking about at the moment, about situating the notion of security within ways in which people are living, things that make and have meaning to people. So, for example, thinking about uh, ecological safety and the safety and the safeguards that the ecological systems provide to people, for example, or food or health and so on. Okay. So, in just as summary then, um, I would say the three key points, the three emerging themes here. One is around, we need new critical frameworks to be able to attribute what's happening at the local level to the global and vice versa in terms of risk. There's a, an opportunity here to instill some responsibility across scales uh, within this framework of global climate risk. And there's obviously space and uh, value in actually encouraging more action to science and science to action. So linking these two communities much better together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Henrik, Johan and Emily. Um, so what, what, what is the relevance? What's, what, what do these parts sort of come together? What do they bring together? We, we, get, we come back to the same two words again. Interconnectedness and interdependence. So what happens if we surpass the one and a half degrees or the two degrees without getting too much into direct causality? What happens if salinization increases at a rate in low-lying deltas, be it Bangladesh or Egypt, for example, that local farmers cannot cope with or adapt, like everybody sort of dismisses this problem as say, but they've lived there for thousands of years. They know how to cope with this. What, are the, what if they're coping, what if they're trying to cope with processes of a pace and a magnitude that surpasses their adaptive capacity to develop saline-resistant seed varieties, for example. What happens when they start moving further south or further north? What happens when they cross a border? What happens when they're expelled from that border? And why do we need to care? It's not our problem. It doesn't happen here. Right? Whether it's climate change, whether it's this, that, or the other. So any calls for, we are going to solve the problems here. We need to look inwards. You can easily dismiss that. It's gonna come and bite us in the A at some point, right? And what happens if we surpass this one and a half or two degrees and start looking at our own infrastructure? That's, this is what we really need to think about. And I think the, the whole purpose 
and the concept behind this symposium were these two words, interconnectedness and interdependence, be it politically, in a conflict, we've heard from Dan, we've done some work on the whole, does climate change have anything to do with the Arab Spring? And we'll come back to that when we get to the panel. So, you can say whatever you want about academics, but we're very good at keeping time. Um, uh, let's uh, refuel a little bit with coffee. I would like to invite you to coffee just down the stairs there, and then we will reconvene again in exactly half an hour. Yeah? 30 minutes back here in half an hour, and we'll have an open conversation. Thank you. Uh, this is the time that we have an open conversation, so it really depends on you whether we're here for five minutes or for another hour. Um, well, let me start with you, Dan, first. And since we've, and I had the pleasure of working with you uh, some years ago, and the whole issue of climate and conflict, um, without going into direct causal relationships or attribution, but one of the things that we came up with in our work was coining the phrase, the consequence of the consequences. And um, what we can kick off with if we just want to elaborate a little bit on that. It's a catchy phrase, but it actually encapsulates a lot of the work that we've done a few years ago. To go to the, the theme that I raised earlier, uncertainties, there's a whole lot of uncertainties about what the effects of global warming are. And the more you try to trace those in detail, and the longer you make the chain of effects, the harder it is to be certain about that absolute attribution. But you can draw, draw up models, essentially, which are narratives of what you could expect to happen based on comparable experience elsewhere, and then you can see. You can see if the real world starts to bear any resemblance to this. So, for example, if people's, um, if the human habitat in some places becomes less habitable because the rainfall pattern changes dramatically, for example, either because precipitation increases or because it concentrates so that the monsoon gets shorter and more dramatic and what used to be 42 days of rain falls in 20 or so days, like in Nepal, or because major weather events like typhoons shift their locations, as they have in the Philippines, or because you get extended droughts, then that has an impact on how people are living. Uh, perhaps they're able to ride it out. Right? But perhaps the impact is so serious and the assistance that is available to them from government or from international organizations is not good enough or quick enough or inclusive enough or, to use a completely non-scientific term, is not kind enough, perhaps it's not reliable enough, then maybe people start to move. And if they move, where do they go? Well, mostly, although there have been a lot of fears raised about climate migration, right? Mo uh, in, U in Europe, for example, mostly people move within their country. And they move from the countryside to the city. At most, they may move across the border. And in that case, to where are they migrating? Are they migrating to areas which can accept, can host, can manage to have those additional people there? If not, they will put pressure on the resources which are there, which are available. They will put pressure on all, all kinds of things, from the availability of drinking water, to firewood, to um, living quarters, and so on. And as that pressure is put on, people will have problems, they will seek explanations, they will identify the outsiders as part of the problem. If the, again, if the government is not inclusive enough, supportive enough, conceivably, the problems will emerge from that. Um, there are all sorts of other scenarios that one could draw up. I think the one which, in terms of tracing consequences of consequences, one of the ones which I find most interesting is if you have droughts and perhaps other climate variability in major food-producing countries, 
what does that do to the world price of staple foods, like, for example, wheat? Right? And what does that do to the price of bread in, for example, a Middle Eastern country, which is a, the world's largest importer of wheat, where people in the good times are spending about 35 to 40 percent of their disposable income on staple foods, and where prices are only kept at a manageable level by government subsidy. What happens if the world price rises dramatically at the end of 2010 as a result of drought in China and um, diverse weather conditions in Australia, the US and Canada? Um, what happens then if the Egyptian government is not able to continue to subsidize the food price effectively? Would you think that people would get angry at that point? You know, I, I go back to my sort of basic learning about these things. Um, a hungry man is an angry man. A song was made out of that. And there is a basic wisdom there. So, in part, lying behind the story of Tahir Square, it is not the full explanation of what happened in Egypt in 2011, not by any means, but in part, there was a change in natural conditions, but not in Egypt. <laughs> It was across the other side of the world. That's what we mean by the consequences of consequences and probably what we mean by interconnected and interdependent. And that was in research that was defined what happened in 2010 as merely a tipping point yeah. rather than the actual cause of what happened. So if I, if I go from this to Emily and to the, what you call the, threat, the human security framework, mm. do you want to elaborate on that a little bit and just kind of pick up from where Dan has left, and how, how would that come into effect, and how would that be uh, of, of value mm -hmm. to uh, processes like these? Yeah, so <clears throat> that framework so, sort of explains how security has been coined and thought about conventionally, traditionally, within sort of international relations and within uh, sort of um, studies around conflict where security is seeking stability, but it's also the nation state seeking its own interests and own territory. So there's something in there which is different to this uh, framework, which um, is more about, as Dan was talking about, the solidarity and engaging with citizens and starting from, so changing the way we think about security, or it might also be changing the way we think about risk and frame risk more from the, the aspects or the sectors or the dimensions in society that have a meaning for people. So, for example, if we think about um, thinking about ecological security in, in, is a more solidarity, we might be thinking about how we safeguard nature for the benefit of people and particularly those most at risk or the, the most vulnerable community. So it's re reframing that. Maybe we could think about creating security with our political systems yeah. in a way that anchors people yeah. better yeah. Um, to be able to be more resilient in a, uh, in a good way. <laughs> we can talk about that. Uh, building capacity and so on and so forth. So it's more thinking about the lo building the strength in the local yeah. context, yeah. Yeah. Um, which maybe um, one can, through a different kind of fr framework, but putting it into practice is where the challenge comes, which is very much what uh, Margaret has been talking about and also yourself about actually putting, implementing these things among citizens and changing the way people think, uh, starting from that point. Which is, which is a lot more holistic than some of the earlier calls that we can somehow battled against of securitizing climate yes. impact, which is actually yes. was quite dangerous of isolating just climate and dealing with it as a security issue. Yes. That leads to a very different type of thinking in that. So bouncing sort of yeah. back with extreme events and with a more holistic approach like this one, um, and including issues of governance, for example, where would that fit, Margaret? You, we're, we're, we're having a whole host of issues in terms of human security generally, from food security to political stability, issues of governance. Um, and there is sometimes, there is also, I, I come from your world, there is sometimes a tendency to also isolate extreme events and still deal with them as a one-off. And they are never a one-off. Of course. 
Can I start? I promised someone in the audience that I would be provocative at least once today. <laughs> yes. I, I thought you've already been several times. <laughs> <laughs> so just on attribution, mm. yes. I mean, this is not a scientific concept yet. It's a political one. So what do we want to spend our energy on in the next 20 years? To really reap the benefits of the breakthrough in Paris, which was, you know, whatever, it was a breakthrough in terms of pulling down the political barriers on a lot of the climate change debate. We have this clim Green Climate Fund, which actually has an enormous amount of money, but they haven't spent a dollar yet. <laughs> so, my, my, when I hear you talk about the important, I agree, long term we will be able to attribute, but are we going, is our choice to get bogged down in the politics of negotiation about attribution? Because for those of you who are not party to this, attribution means compensation, and compensation is where we've been stuck for the past 20 years of endless negotiation. So the, I, I just want us to think concretely about... <laughs> I'm I provoking her, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have to do that also, but in the next decade, I think, because my second point on this getting stuck with the event, and um, over the, the year, the five years leading to 2015, like everybody else, I went to billions of conferences on climate change and extreme events. And uh, I realized very quickly that the only concrete way that the climate community had to show climate change was a disaster. So essentially I said, I can sit back and wait for them to finish because they are doing the job for us on the risk management, except that they didn't want to take the risk word. Mm -hmm. So, so this is a bit where we are right now. We've reached a convergence point, and in a way the disasters have helped the climate community to illustrate some of the most dramatic consequences, but certainly not all of climate change. We have pushed the risk word forward, and to and I, I was also thinking of a wise man who once said that a, ve a required quality in a good scientist is imagination. So how do we move to actually start imagining what those risks could be and try to really bring them down to concrete things? Because I think, you know, there are so many political, social, emotional solidarity factors that will continue to drive our need to help people in the event. So the ones that take the responsibility for the longer term thinking, the socio-economic development, etc., have to be almost forced through policy measures and political measures. <laughs> and we are not, we will never stop helping people. That's yeah, our sure. good side, and we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But we should be a bit wiser on how we distribute the resources. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I, I'm not going to take the words in my mouth that politicians do these days, is disasters are becoming too expensive, so we have to invest more in development. That is not the logic. <laughs> Yeah. Because that doesn't solve the political challenges yeah. that yeah. come along the way. So, no. yeah. so there you are. But, Attribution. Well, <laughs> well, the, the, what, what I'm optimistic about, and we, we've been in this field for quite some time, is at least these two communities are talking to each other. That's yeah. a good start. The yes. climate community yes. and the disaster community. Yes. <laughs> now, we turn to infrastructure systems and societal systems. What you've, we've listened to Emily's uh, presentation. How do you see this holistic human security framework reflected or of value to the way we perceive we deal with risk to critical infrastructure, for example? Yeah. Now, it's not isolated by itself, but it's part and parcel yeah. of the whole. And I don't mean just in Sweden here, but... No, but I mean, you realize when you listen to all these speakers that uh, things are connected and... <laughs> Of course, they are connected to a higher extent than only among in critical infrastructures. 
I mean, you, you, you yourself, you mentioned the consequences of consequences and food prices rising in a place that is not sort of physically connected directly. Um, that tells me that these dependencies and interdependencies are crucial to understand many of these issues that we are dealing with here. And if there is one lesson that, that I've learned from sort of looking at critical infrastructure is that we have a tendency to narrow our focus and, and look and try to divide the problem into segments and try to solve one at a time. And then we imagine ourselves that we can just put the pieces back together again. I don't think that works always, not with these complex uh, problems. You have to look at it from a holistic perspective. And I guess that is also valid when you broaden the perspective to a more sort of ecological system as yeah. well. Yeah, which, which goes back to sort yeah. of the, one of the definitions of resilience is that if you get to a system that demonstrates characteristics that are not present yeah. in the parts or the components of the system <coughs> or one that is capable of learning self-organizing and adapting to the unknown, then you get to a completely different outcome. Absolutely, and in this discourse, we're quite bad at operationalizing resilience in that way. Mm -hmm. We are good at <clears throat> studying resilience despite systems mm -hmm. rather than thanks to systems, mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to get better at understanding what are actual resilient systems rather than some resilient actors in a perhaps very brittle and unforgiving system. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a totally different approach from investing in actors and looking at the system as a whole. Is MSB doing this? Looking mm -hmm. at the systems as a whole yes. or having a holistic perspective? Yeah. Yeah. I think we are, but I also think, I also want to be once again a bit modest here and admit that it is super difficult. I've heard Dan saying that conflict, that it's not necessarily a bad thing, that it's, it's about development, it's about evolution. And I think it's a little bit the same thing in our line of business, crisis management, that a crisis is in a way an opportunity because it actually helps open your mind. Okay, so this was also possible. This seemingly unexpected is possible. So, because I feel that one of the things we are constantly struggling with is to get uh, the, the attention of the political leadership about things that haven't as yet happened because they seem so unrealistic. So, uh, you know, we, we have these scenarios, um, but we can never really model. We can never really model the interconnectedness. We can never really capture these worst case scenarios. Um, we are though, right now I should say, and this is very much a result of also what we're doing in, in civil defense planning, and we have this new buzzword uh, called hybrid threats. Uh, which is what is happening, you could say, also in the grey zone uh, before we move in, into a war. And uh, here we are talking about, I would say, a number of things, really bad things, possibly happening at the same time. Uh, so you could have for example, a disinformation campaign. You could have a sabotage against critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. This could coincide with an extreme weather event. So you could have this happening at the same time and that you, then you get a really nasty scenario. Mm -hmm. And this will possibly never, you know, we can't really, you know, take it down and say, okay, so this is how it will happen. But what we can do is to think, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna put our systems, we're gonna stress them to the ultimate extent. And what do we need in those kinds of situations? Well, we will need a set of generic capabilities because that's where we end up. As somebody mentioned here, the scope keep, keeps growing all the time. Yeah. We cannot even imagine all the things that will happen. Yeah. Then we have to go back and say, okay, so what do we need in every kind of really difficult crisis situation? Well, we will need a set of capabilities to manage that situation. It will be quite basic. We will have to communicate. We will always need crisis communication. Mm. Our citizens will need water, heating, food. Mm. So we have to work in that way and, and really think also about these prolonged scenarios that can happen. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And before I turn to you, the audience, and open the floor for questions, I actually have an anecdote that I never tire of 
saying it. Between 2008 and 2010, I had the privilege of being part of a project run by the International Migration Institute at the University of Oxford. And it was a Eurocentric, and we were building future migration scenarios. And scenario building draws on expertise from all over the world, so labor, unions, investment bankers, oil companies, uh, people like me, migration experts, etc., etc. In uh, December 2009, we were in The Hague, and one of the implausible uh, assumptions, when you build a scenario, you put the sort of plausible assumptions and the implausible assumptions on the quadrant, and one of the implausible assumptions was uh, massive upheavals in the Middle East leading to mass population movement, and everybody said, yeah, all right, okay, um, let's move on to the serious stuff. That was December 2010, lo and behold, what happened in, and that, as uh, Johan said, and as Emily said, we can't use these paradigms of planning for a world that we think up to 2010 when the paradigm had completely shifted, but we were still dealing with a certain world. We were still thinking that the Middle East and the regimes in the Middle East are a certain an unchallenged certainty. So, in an uncertain world, and in what we're trying to unpack here, uh, we're here to engage and to answer more questions. We've got a couple of microphones floating around. Uh, please raise your hand, the microphone will come to you, and before you do, could I just ask you to introduce yourself, and uh, we would like to focus on questions rather than an actual thesis. So could you be brief with your question so we can devote more time to the discussion? No worries, I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Tamara, I'm a master's student on sustainability, and I just want to ask the panel, what the role of businesses is and of innovation when discussing planning in all this disaster management. Thanks. Is this a, a specific to any of the members of the panel or who would like to take this? We'll, we'll take one question at a time. So anybody would like to respond? Uh, Sarah? Well, I mean, I, I confessed earlier during my intervention <laughs> that we aren't working enough with private sector, but obviously business has a big role to play here. And uh, I mean, it suffice to, to look at, at all these critical infrastructures that we would, we're discussing what one of the values of national security here is maintaining the functionality of our, uh, of our critical infrastructures. And for this, we need to interact. And we did a very interesting project a few years ago where we looked at uh, Mälaren and we, uh, we looked at how Mälaren could be flooded and we actually went around and talked to, uh, first of all, all these municipalities surrounding, but also all the businesses that lay around Mälaren. And we discussed with them, how, how would this affect you? If Mälaren would rise and all these, uh, this would be underwater, uh, these service tunnels would be underwater, we would have electricity uh, failure here, uh, communications would be disrupted here. And we had this discussion with them and it was so valuable and it gave rise, I think, to a lot of positive effects within these municipalities in terms of dialogue with business. So yes, of course, business has a super important role here. Uh, we also do, I mean, we fund, we, have, uh, we fund research and we aren't really, I would say, doing innovation within MSB, but we are actually funding an innovation platform within the Swedish Defence Research Agency. And, uh, they are looking at various solutions, I mean, in terms of also how we're developing our equipment, for example, in what we're doing in, in rescue services. Innovations are absolutely necessary. Uh, I mean, it's, um, we see, um, uh, I can mention another concrete example that we've been looking at uh, things like antimicrobial resistance, for example. How will this change society? Well, here we can see that this will have quite concrete impact on our line of business. It will affect how we can interact with patients, it will affect our equipment, uh, it will affect um, how ambulance services work. So 
many, many examples of this. So business have a, a very important role to play. But um, we need to, I think, as I said before, I think we need to find also new ways of engaging with them. We aren't doing enough. Yeah. Margareta? Let, let me just tell you, I think there are two or three things to consider why it hasn't happened yet <clears throat> and how we went about getting business involved in defining their own role and contribution to Sendai. First, and that takes some energy, you need to work with business so that they define their own interest in actually mm. not engaging, but in de de uh, defending or protecting their own business sustainability their money, their labor force, their water, transport, their infrastructure. And so we did a, we did a work actually with um, PwC as a helping agent, and we sp spent an enormous amount of time even getting into the CEO's office for this question. That was, you know, 20% win <laughs> among the many we tried. And, you know, we're not really understanding who are these people, disasters, humanitarian things. Yes, we give money. Yes, we send trucks. So after some hard work and thinking through risk management and what happens to you and how do you pay for it and do it actually get to your boardroom and how does it turn up into your financial reports? So the more you talk about it, the more it became a more real issue and you can also see how business actually discount for losses that they don't want to declare. So one thing that we have found is of course that business lose money in disaster situations, but they hide it. They hide the losses, they just disappear. What they cannot hide is that people don't come to work because there is no transport, um, because the kids are not going to school, because the schools are closed, etc. So that whole process of defining their own interest in engaging is number one. Secondly is to really look at what is the cost actually, how much, what are the losses, the direct ones and the indirect ones, and who pays? And this differs between country. Once upon a time in the 50s, I think, in the United States, the government basically paid, um, the private sector paid 90% of all cost that disasters incurred. That has completely turned around. Today, the government pays the 90% and the private sector pays, well, I think individuals pay the rest and the business pay very little. You know that many governments, they actually pay business to get back into business in order to get the economy rolling again. And the third point, or the fourth rather, I would like to comment is, is the most difficult one to deal with, is this, and Sarah touched on it, is this mutual reluctance. Business don't want to get over-regulated, so be careful, don't get too close to government. There is an option, participate in designing the regulation, but mostly it's don't get too close. And governments, they don't really think this is nice stuff. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons that keep them apart. So um, I, I think a starting point is defining the common interest. Mm -hmm. And the common interest is around things that have an impact on both of the sectors. And, uh, you know, Japan sometimes is held up as very good at this collaboration with private sector, but it's essentially through regulation and legislation, which is fine, it's worked, they are there, but that doesn't work everywhere. So I think this is a, it's a major opportunity, it's a necessity, but finding the governance model that makes it feasible and natural and spontaneous still remains to be done. And we've been testing, we were testing, we asked for volunteers among some government, can you volunteer and um, businesses to come and talk, no press releases, no profile. Just how can this work in reality so that we don't have to recreate it every time? Uh, and, and maybe I should mention also this is normally among uh, manufacturing industry. There's a huge work to be done with tourism industry. 
There is an enormous work to be done by finance and capital. Uh, Dan mentioned all these 30% of all, 50% uh, of all the cities that we have to live in haven't been built yet. That's a lot of trillions of dollars of investment. So if capital wants to protect their investment for the future, there is a model for how they can do it. It exists, it's not to be innovated, it already exists. So how do you motivate them? You have to pull them all out of the caves. <laughs> And it's Sarah who needs to do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. Thank you, Margaret. And 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 there is also, I mean, there, there is a emerging trend of socially and ecologically responsible entrepreneurs. Absolutely. Yeah. There are some coming, not just the yeah. the giant ones doing the uh, corporate social mm. responsibility, but mm. young, aware, active mm. entrepreneurs who are starting companies that with a very different ethos of that. Mm -hmm. We had another question here. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Svetlo Tsolova and I work in a European Agency for Disease Prevention and Control. Maybe some of you are aware of, some of you not. It's located in Stockholm and our mandate is collecting data and making risk assessments uh, specifically for infectious diseases. So we touch upon almost all the topics that were discussed today and I would like to thank you very much for the very enlightenment talks. My question is, we talked just right now about involvement of probably private sector and business, but still governments probably need to be much more engaged. And um, in health area, thanks to Margareta and her team, uh, health has been now much more present in Sendai framework and then there are Bangkok principles on, on health. But it's held after a disaster. But what about if a disaster is caused by health issue, like by infectious disease? And we don't hear much about infectious diseases because it, it, there, is, there was a lot of work in the last 50 years to prevent them. So there, there has been a lot of investment. But we see the opposite trend now. Governments disinvest in public health, especially with the financial crisis where there were significant reductions in public health services, mm -hmm. including health. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, we, we hear from Sarah that still needs to be done mm. with engaging and, and, and promoting, but how do we really promote preparedness planning to the governments so that they would invest? So um, I think many of the speakers can answer this, but I would be curious to hear because it's one of our tasks as well. Thank sure. you. Sure. Sarah, would you like to respond? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we do have contingency planning. We have actually at national level a contingency plan for pandemic preparedness that was born out of H1N1. Um, so we're doing that. And uh, when it comes to preventive efforts uh, or even things like, for example, I mean, what we're looking at is a bit like you need to stockpile certain medicines, for example, in terms of that we're moving more into preparedness. So we are doing this, but this is a, it's a constant struggle. It's a matter of resources and, and what, you, what you're giving a priority to. Uh, but... Uh, I would say that Sweden, compared to many other countries, still has a reasonably high level of preparedness in this area. Um, that would be my answer. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think that there was no doubt that after the Ebola crisis in West Africa, um, there was almost a consensus and an agreement that this was not just an epidemic. This was a failure in a public health system. If you had had a public health system, a functioning one, in any of these countries, mm. then a lot of this could have been contained yeah. and not spread as bushfire as, as it were. So, and I think when you talk about preparedness to that, well, mm. of course, there is preparedness in terms of stockpiling, in terms, yeah. but you're supposed to be managing the residual risk yeah. rather than sort of the actual outbreak. Mm. A public health system would, con would contain that. Before we move on to the next question, and can I, can I put you on the spot again? And um, with something like the Ebola crisis, which is also a classic case of a cascading um, 
How do you how do you see that? Not not actually something similar happening in Sweden, but how do you? What would be your advice as a system of systems to a country like Sierra Leone or Liberia or uh, Guinea, for example? Want to play with that? Oh. <laughs> Not really to uh, advise on healthcare systems, but I mean, I could reflect on the interconnectedness here. And, yeah. and obviously, transport systems are interconnected now, and that opens up, again, possibilities for consequences of consequences, spreading of diseases. And I mean, one lesson one can learn from, from studying the design of these type of, of systems is compartmentation. I mean, you, 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 you need the ability to compartmentalize to contain things. Otherwise, you, you will simply spread it to the whole system. Okay, good. Can I? Dan? Yeah. Yes. Um, in Liberia, there was a point for the approximately the first half of the Ebola crisis when the government's reaction was quarantine. Mm. And it was essentially an enforcement response. Mm. And to some degree, I mean, it was certainly policing, and to so, some degree, it was direct military response. And the epidemic continued and getting out of control. And at a point, they essentially reversed their policy. And they said, we can't do this by enforcement. We can only do this by consent. We have to explain. We have to mobilize. We have to get people's support for this so that they stop breaking out of the quarantine areas. Mm -hmm. We still want them to stay, <laughs> to stay put, but they must understand why they should be staying put. Mm -hmm. And you, you've commented ab about this point of the governments um, becoming willing to evaluate themselves and hold themselves to standards. Well, the Liberian government carried out its own evaluation afterwards and said, you know, we got it wrong for half the time, yeah. and then we started to get it right. Yeah. And, as, you know, and the uh, crisis fell away quite quickly. In Nigeria, there was a real fear that Ebola was going to spread. And I don't know if you remember the details at all, but there were a, a few cases reported, and then suddenly not. And I think almost everybody has who has looked at that has said, well, there was a, a quick um, dissemination of so-called Ebola rules. Uh, this is how you relate to each other. Uh, don't shake hands, don't kiss, don't get close, stay a certain distance from each other, just everybody, just, you know. And this was all spread by social media. Now, to think of this as being a triumph for social media would be one way around. But my question is, well, where did that information come from? And why was it trusted? Because that is the key thing. I think that a lot, when one's talking about resilience and thinking of it as a generic capability, the issue is information. Is this a community, a group, a society, a company, a person who can absorb information, analyze and understand it, mm -hmm. figure out what to do with it, disseminate as necessary, and act upon it? If so, you'll probably find then that you have a kind of fungible resilience that will... that helps that community or whatever um, handle conflict, mm -hmm. um, respond creatively to epidemics, uh, deal with extreme weather events. Um, you, you will find because they have adaptability. Information is in many ways the core of this, uh, this whole thing. We've got time for one or two more questions. So, sure. And you've got yeah. three, so go for three. three. So, my name is Shu Liang, sorry. Um, I'm a master's student here at Dune University, and I would like to just uh, ask for a story. Um, so far, we've heard a lot of perspectives, but one thing I noticed when I was doing my internship in Kenya was that we, like a lot of people working in the field, we are believers. And the truth of the matter is, it's the, the real resistance is in, in people's reluctance in buying into mainstreaming DRR. Uh, disaster risk reduction. So I would like to get your story in your career, how you've witnessed some, some resistance turn into support. I mean, I think we can all think of a few leaders that can, can turn their to, to different camps. So if you can share a story um, that we can draw some wisdom from, that would be great. <laughs> Who wants to take that? And very quickly, so we can take two more questions. 
story <laughs> that changed <laughs> things. Um, maybe for me, it's a personal story which changed the way that I wanted to approach the so-called community involvement. I say so-called because, you know, community can be really the lowest level of a society, but um, I decided in the beginning of this job to go and visit community cities that had been affected by disasters 10, 15, 20 years earlier, just to understand what stays with you. Because what stays with people will have to be the issues we have to tackle. So, um, uh, I visited Maharashtra, uh, which 15 years then, so 20 years earlier, had an earthquake. And they were given by very nice people new earthquake houses. Very nice, moved the village. So, meeting with lots of women and men for that matter, but separately. So, when I asked the women, um, so, What's the result of all this? What do you remember? Well, no one remembered the houses, except a grandmother who was very happy that her kids had now a safe house. But what they remember was the two things. One, they said there were lots of these livelihoods projects, really useless. We were just selling things to each other. <laughs> there you go. And secondly, when I, I asked them, well, what do you think people like me could do for you? Is there anything that I can take away here with me? They say, yeah, you, can you tell us how we can reach the highest level of our government and the world so that they can deal with these climate change issues? Our harvests are completely confused. The rains never come when we expect them. The seeds don't work. So that I have used then as an approach. The other one, I actually went back to Kobe in Japan after the earthquake and talked to some people, and it was the same thing, what really stayed. And what really stayed were two things, and eventually they had a very successful reconstruction. The first thing was the economic disempowerment. They never got their jobs back. And people lost social dignity. And, and, and then social health, because a lot of violence in the family and substance abuse. So that's what I took away from there. So you can see it's social and economic issues. It's not physical issues, actually. Thank you, Margaret. I've been given uh, very stern signals that we're out of time. <laughs> okay. So what, I, what I'm going to do now is just ask the panels to go around very quickly and in two or three words each just tell us tell everybody what are the sort of the one or two key messages that we walk away from here with i'm going to start with you emily and okay. we'll go around that okay way. very quickly i was just thinking my story would be that we all are heroes of our own stories and the complexity here is if every stakeholder is a hero in their own story we have to try and think about ways in which we bring those heroes together to understand their different perspectives. Wonderful. Johan. Nice. Um, if we do not want to use actual disasters as window of opportunity for change, we need to come up with new ways of requisite imagination, if you like, when it comes to how we imagine future possible states and possible ways to interact. And that, I think, is by embracing in cultural activities. Uh, read more literature, get inspired by operas. That, yeah. I think, yeah. would be yeah. a Fantastic. really interesting risk management initiatives if we do not want to wait for the next disasters. Mm. Wonderful. He plays opera in his office and I can hear it from my... <laughs> That's yeah. not even true. <laughs> <laughs> Hendrik. Yes, more briefly. I mean, in a world where everything is connected to everything else, I think we need to collaborate to manage risk. There is simply no other way. Sarah? Well, I'm on the same line here. I thought it was fascinating to hear about the fact that risks or this interconnectedness, it's so much about social networks, it's about people. And I think that really captures the essence of it all here, that, that that's the way forward. We need to cherish these networks. Yeah. Yes, two brief points. One is that recovery happens after a disaster because it must. Right? There's no must about prepar preparedness. 
So it requires a, a conscious, collective, deliberate, intercultural, creative effort. And the other thing is that it's never a certain world. It has never been a certain world. But sometimes it looks certain. Well, we now have the luxury. This is an uncertain seeming world. And maybe that can liberate our imaginations a bit. Margaret. For me, just a few words. I, you may have heard participants using the word acceptable risk. I want you to think about how that is possible. Who decides what is acceptable risk for you or for us? Because this is sort of becoming a popular concept which is really dangerous. So please think about it and take a position. I can't tell you what it is. Just take a position. <laughs> Thank you very much, Margreta, Dan, Sarah. Henrik, Johan, and Emily, and on behalf of the panel. And I would like to invite Jonas Hafström now to uh, bring this event to a close. Please. Should we step down? Yeah. Thank you. Dear friends, it's been a long day, and between me and the end of the, between you and the end of the conference, I'm standing here, so I better make it quick. Well, thank you all very much for coming to this day-long event, embracing the theme, uh, Is the World Becoming a Better Place? I hope you have enjoyed it and found it rewarding and also thought-provoking. This week started last Sunday. It was a panel discussion, and four items were discussed. Democracy, sustainability, equality, and connectivity. And the students at the university gave their own perspective. One young student said, and I quote, if we don't believe in what we are doing, we wouldn't have anything else to work for, end of quote. Indeed, if we don't believe that our approach generates long-term progress, jobs, welfare, at the same time preventing wars and conflicts and protecting values such as democracy, freedom and human rights, then we have been wrong for a long time, or heavy. I will give you a personal example. It was the early 1990s. I was working for Prime Minister Carl Bildt, and just before Christmas 1992, the Prime Minister took his closest foreign policy advisors, visiting our soldiers serving with the United Nations peacekeeping operation in Croatia. War was raging in Bosnia, and so we ventured down to the bridge on the border between the two countries bus after bus with desperate refugees was crossing over. The ethnic cleansing of Western Bosnia was in its final stages. At home, here in Sweden, we struggle with both an economic crisis and a more massive influx of refugees than we had ever had. One year, brought about 100,000 women, children, and men fleeing in the carnage of the Balkans. Most of them were from Bosnia, and most of them were Muslims. The combination of that influx and the increasing unemployment made for a toxic debate. Some rallied with whatever argument possible against refugees. And sorry to say, some even resorted to violence. Of course, we had difficulties with this massive influx of refugees from the Balkan Wars. Years later, we faced organized crimes, gangs originating in the tight Balkan smuggling networks that grew up during the wars. There were some brutal shootouts between them in Stockholm. Yet today, some decades later, the story is one of success. Numerous studies have shown 
that the Bosnian refugees have integrated well in the Swedish society. On average, they do as well, or even marginal better, than those born in the country. And they are everywhere, in sports, in culture, in business, and in politics. They have given added flavor to our country. But it's still very much Sweden. They wave the flag, and they sing the songs. And I believe they have made Sweden a better country. There are, of course, not the only group that has come to Sweden. No less than 17% of our population is from Finland. And I believe we have even more people from Iran than from Bosnia. They are as successful in Sweden as they are in California. Now, many from Syria have also come, although we have had Syrian communities in this country for years. Some groups have sometimes taken longer time to integrate. And the strict structure of our welfare society are more geared to protecting insiders than opening up to outsiders. We need to do better. Every country has its share of challenges. And in much the same way as when we received the refugees from Bosnia, there are certainly those today with different views of how Sweden is managing the latest influx from the Middle East. Donald Trump, for example. I think we should be proud of what our country did during some of the difficult years to offer a new future to some of those fleeing the horrors of the Balkan Wars. That it would turn out to benefit our society our society is, of course, also part of making the world becoming a better place. I thank all those who have taken part in today's conference, and I look forward to working together on just that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> And, uh, and before we bring this to a final close, um, there are, I've got word of thanks to quite a few people. I can't take full credit for this. Um, none of this would have happened without the uh, unbelievable efforts of two of my dear and esteemed colleagues, Magnus Hagelstein and Jenny Yao Jorgensen. Could you please stand up, please, so that people know where you are? And we have been, we've been working together for the last four months. Karen, Louise, and the whole team who organizes the uh, Jubilee events, and everybody who contributed to this, including the technical team here, have been changing our batteries quite regularly. Um, thank you very much for coming. I can make you a promise that when we celebrate another 350 years of Lund University, I will be doing this in fluent Swedish by that time, and um, um, I, I was told to do this, and I didn't do it at the beginning uh, or the opening of it, but from the point we started planning this event, we always knew that it was going to be great. It was going to be fantastic. It was going to be incredible. We knew that all along. Thank you very much.